you can say that music is heavy because of the way it sounds, but for me it comes from more like the experience of the people making it. That's what makes it heavy. I'd rather be high or die than live, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, you can have an acoustic guitar and, and one vocal and it can be the heaviest thing in the world. Heavy, heavy's about being pissed off and being a warlord and laying down like, just like someone like that was in battle, just if they had an ax and just chopped some dude in the head and it landed and you have a riff that plays the same way that way, that's heavy. <laughs> The Beatles first came to America, they had these tiny little amplifiers, you couldn't hear anything except girls screaming. That all changed when like Marshall and Laney and Orange started making these big giant uh, high wattage amplifiers that all of a sudden, you know, shut the entire crowd up. A large part of early hard rock music is just trying to make sense of what you do with all this distortion and all this volume. There's things you can do with a clean reverb tone that are so that are so evil and dark. It, it, it makes Black Sabbath sound like, you know, Peggy Lee. People are starting to realize it's like there's moving away from that idea of it's just being like headbanging or whatever, devil horns, heavy rock music, we're making weird shit. So how are we gonna get this sound? Are we gonna, how oh, we can put them in a closet, a small space? Like, come on, we gotta put them in a coffin, you know? See what kind of vocal uh, performance we can get and also what kind of tone we can get out of this. A flatted fifth is a lot heavier than like a... Well. You know what I mean? It's down to earth, it's oftentimes raw, and uh, it's, it's real. And when you get really technically proficient, that sucks the soul out of rock and roll. When somebody really has something to say, and I'm not saying verbally necessarily, but emotionally, uh, it comes out of the music and it just hits you. That's heavy music to me. It doesn't necessarily have to be all about loud guitars, even though I love loud guitars. It seems like heavy in the modern idiom is always like something with distortion and a lot of volume some sort of reference to the first heavy bands, you know, Black Sabbath and Blue Cheer, and Led Zeppelin. The whole experience of coming of age in the early 1970s was uh, very, it was very, um, very tense and, and rife with problems that mainstream entertainment wasn't addressing and definitely not even mainstream pop music. I would love to go back to the 70s and relive it because, I mean, you had Black Sabbath at their peak, you had Captain Beyond, you had Dry Heath, you had Deep Purple and Rock, you had Mountain, you had Grand Funk, you had the Stooges, you had, you know, Atomic Rooster, Dust, The Groundhog, Stray, all these incredible bands. Since 72, it's, it's actually been done. Downhill. Was, yeah, after Volume 4 was released. Sabbath. Unnecessary point of discussion. I keep referring back to Hawkwind because they were a really, really big influence on me back in the day. Somewhere in the Green River days, discovered Hawkwind, uh, and have uh, been in love with like those first four or five records ever since. Mount Zeppelin, you know, uh, you know, free. Like all kids our age, I mean, Kiss. We had all the Dictators records. James Gang. Joe Walsh, Neil Young, yeah, yeah. Leaf Hack, or Mahavishnu Orchestra, General Giant, 
Quincy and uh, Atlas Cooper. Atlas Cooper was like the first cool record I ever got. Of course I like Atlas. Sabbath, but I mean, that's the obvious. They know Sabbath and it's great, but Sabbath has played out. A lot of the bands that, that we were into, Bobby and I specifically were into, were these what I call like B-level bands or C-level bands like Dust, Lord Baltimore. Sir Lord Baltimore, I mean, I didn't know they existed until a couple years ago and I heard it and I just started cracking up because it's fucking gnarly. <laughs> you, know, you play these records that were just, you know, oh, that's not Steely Dan, it's not, you know, that's not hard, it's not Barracuda, it's not Super Tramp. You know, in a way, Black Sabbath was never on the radio, but people went to gigs. And I think that's why there was more money for those bands touring. And they could get known, they could sell platinum without ever getting on the radio. In the 70s, there was a lot more regional hard rock. There were bands like Pentagram in Washington, D.C. that weren't part of the major label system. Pentagram formed uh, in late 71. Bobby was the first. I will tell you that right now. Bobby Leland was the first. Literally, one night, Bobby and I were sitting in a friend's house, getting stoned like we did <laughs> just about every night. Um, and we said, you know, why don't we put together a band that, that is exactly what we both want to do? Oh, she's getting out of hand. During the time I was in the band, 71 to 76, I'd say we were a hard rock band, you know, maybe a heavy hard rock band, but we weren't a, we weren't a heavy metal band. We didn't want to play clubs because clubs didn't want us to play in them uh, because we didn't do covers. If you listen to Bobby's songs, they were creative, incredibly inventive songs with weird beat changes and weird chord progressions and weird time stuff and stuff. But, the labels would say this isn't radio friendly. There's, we can't sell this. You know, we don't hear a single. And these are gonna be some of my last days here. We wanted to just record our own material and go straight to getting signed. Um, and so we had various managers who stuck with us for various periods of time that would, uh, you know, take us into the studio, pay for the sessions, and uh, try and get us a, a record label deal. Each time they failed. Lieber and Krebs in Columbia, they wanted Bobby. And eventually Bobby got some kind of big audition in New York City at a big studio. That was the straw that definitely caused a lot of severe damage to the camel's back uh, because Bobby basically blew our Columbia Records deal. We wanted to do a better vocal, but you know, the guy who was paying for our sessions, Columbia Records, said, don't worry about it, and that should have been the end of the subject, and Bobby wanted his way, and so there you go. That was the end of Columbia Records. The problem really became the drugs. Bobby got a bad reputation. And Bobby really sat on the edge of being a fucking legendary rock star his entire life. And a Graham I missed the first time around. I think their records were almost impossible to find. And I didn't even hear about Pentagram until their records started getting reissued. Bobby had all this stuff, and believe it or not, even back then, th this stuff was, even if it was 8-track, sometimes even 4-track, it was amazing quality. Uh, Bobby had worked out a deal with Relapse, and uh, they were going to put out this compilation of, of a lot of our 70s demos, the studio demos we'd done with the various managers. I love the I love the Pentagram stuff in the 80s and 90s, and I, I'm really proud of Bobby for keeping Pentagram going for all these years. Because you know, if he hadn't kept the band going, you wouldn't be talking to me right now.
just got like a, a basic structure, you know, you got the skeleton, but then there's like so much space. You know, those, those parts last, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes in a run, and then we'll just like go off for like 20 minutes and it's always gonna be different. It's just jamming. It's always playing off each other and like, you know, we, I always call it the, the cosmic nod. I think it's a very spiritual, spiritual thing. Um, especially, I mean, like for us when we play, definitely, I mean, at length, that way where we can, you know, I'm, I'm maybe write a note for you know, five minutes and just kind of noodle over it, and it does give you room to think, and um, just kind of explore what's going on in your head, let you drift off. talk about it and we're like, well, should we try and write some songs and just, you know, or should we get a singer and, and we just kind of said, well, we kind of like it how it is. Metal in the 80s became very formula. Uh, all you need to do is look at Judas Priest's Turbo album and, <laughs> and compare that to you know things like Stained Glass and Sin After Sin and you can see what happened to music in the 80s. Early uh, psychedelic hard rock ended when the, the drug of choice became cocaine. All of the negative aspects of studio recording are amplified by cocaine use uh, by the engineers, the producers, the musicians. A lot of it hinged on production and just sounding just exactly so in the studio. And then you had your weird underground stuff. Lay down your soul to the gods rock and roll! You know, maybe Venom. Metallica was kind of straddling the punk and metal thing. So I wasn't really part of, like, the whole Ozzy Osbourne, like, Judas Priest crap. 
you didn't really have punks going to metal shows or metal people going to punk shows. Um, and then around, you know, 84, 85, the line started to get blurred a little bit. There was actually was a defining moment, actually, when the obsessed was accepted by the punk community. And that's like when we played this little bar with Iron Cross and the PA went out. And uh, instead of stopping, we just played our whole set with the PA, just fucking like screaming in the air, and played everything like twice as fast. After that, Sab said, man, yeah, okay, no, I know you guys are for real. I think a lot of the DC hardcore bands were kind of what got me into doing it. Bands like, I think, Rites of Spring and Void and Nation of Ulysses. Somebody told me, I was like, oh, if, you're, if you think Metallica's is fast, you should check out DRI, you know, and COC and some of these other um, hardcore bands from the early 80s. And the very first time we saw the Melvins, I realized that a band can completely clear a room or completely change somebody's life. <laughs> faster, 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 and then the Melvins came along from you. Like, awesome! <laughs> Motorhead doesn't get enough credit, I would say that, because they were the first real punk metal hybrid. Corrosion were a perfect example of that, St. Vitus were a perfect example of that, you know. But even, and even Black Flag was, except Black Flag was so popular that their fans were willing to, to go to the shows anyway just to hear stuff from my war. Black Flag played in the desert probably around 1981. You know, the desert, even so now, but more so 15, 20 years ago, was primarily a retirement community. It's like a, a, a vacuum of like, you know, music culture. There was no question of going to LA. I never went to LA. I mean, if I went to Palm Springs, that was like a big thing. <laughs> there was no record store packing, you know, Maximum Rock and Roll or Flipside. It was all about the desert. And, and it wasn't something we celebrated. Maybe, maybe like it might be today. The desert is a place for the newly wed and the nearly dead. I mean, it's like, it's that place. The bands were coming, and there were like punk rock bands that, that were developing out there. The earlier ones were like Dead Issue and, and Scabies Babies. There was a band called Dead Issue that I was a part of. Um, that became Across the River with Mario Lolly. Uh, Alfredo Hernandez was also in that band, and he played in Caius for a while, and Queens of the Stone Age. There were a few other people, but I would say, like, that, that little, the earliest nucleus of, you know, if, if you want to say Across the River, was like one of the ones that, like, I just remember so vividly. That was like a moment of change. The whole SST scene, that was like our idols. Black Flag, Meat Puppets, Minutemen, October Faction. These are their hot peppers here. There's like a, some, uh, these look like some kind of banana peppers there. These, oh uh, yeah, these, these are Thai dragons. When these turn red, man, these motherfuckers are hotter than hell. What is them? First of all, but my understanding of the style of music that w we want to call doom is kind of just like I've said before, just like a gut, like a real visceral uh, emotional pull. Something that'll make you cry. Whatever. When I think that when I really moved into like a concrete form of I'm in a doom band, definitely with St. Vitus. We played a few shows with St. Vitus when they had their old singer, Scott Riegers. And then they got the new guy, Wino. Uh, his first show was on my 21st birthday in 1986 at this little community center in Palm Desert. DRI, St. Vitus, and Across the River. It always felt like Across the River was onto something really special. We'd have album 
albums by everything from Mountain to Black Sabbath, uh, early Metallica, just all kinds of stuff. And, and we were kind of combining that with the, the feelings that we got from punk rock. Speakers just fucking melting in front of you. And I, I loved that sound. And so we started going back and instead of just it was slower, slow down, volume, saturation, blues. They, they like just alienated themselves from that, that whole game of like playing fast and, and you know and riffing around and gnarly, like the whole punk metal thing. They just went, they just bypassed that and went straight to rock. No one was really doing that. Towards the end of the Cross the River, Soundgarden was starting to make waves in Seattle. And they were actually part of SST. You know, the same kind of stuff was brewing up there that was brewing out here. Nobody, everybody knew me as a singer for St. Bites, but nobody knew I played guitar. And so, it's kind of an interesting situation where I think it was uh, Scott and Mario's original band, Across the River. We jammed at a party, a generator party, out near Ventura by the beach. I was playing drums, he was playing guitar. I didn't know he could play guitar. And Mario Lolly was playing bass. And we did this crazy jam. And afterwards, we were just like, man, we gotta do a fucking band one of these days. Called up Scott, and we, we made, we agreed to forge ahead as the obsessed. And so that's what we did. It was me, Scott Reeder, and Greg Rogers. Not soon after that, after struggling a little bit here and there, Scott Reeder left to join Caius. That's when Caius basically exploded. They were like the only band in the desert, like touring and um, doing doing it, you know. They were the ones. They were the ones that like basically started perpetuating like our universe out there. They were like the template. I mean, if there was like a blueprint for, you know, desert rock, I guess they would be it. Guys like Mario Lally and Caius really took it, took the next step by not only saying, you know, we're insulated, so maybe we don't know what the hip thing is elsewhere, but they actually embraced that and said, not only are we going to reject what the hip thing is, we're going to reject the mass, the masses at the same time. We're going to reject all of it. I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, a lot of it had to do with just, we just started smoking grass, <laughs> you know. You take a group of kids that are digging, you know, aggressive music, and, and certainly like hardcore punk, and they start smoking dope. An well, interesting thing happens, you know. That's an interesting music. Truth, fiction, stranger than any lie. Smooth conviction, danger plan, a twisted night. What happened to the obsessed was, is that thrash hit. Slayer and that type of music was just too big. That was it. I mean, that's what the 80s became. Either you were a hair band or you were a thrash band. If anybody deserved to be a rock star, it'd be that guy. Yeah. It's like, so, it's like heaven. You're cursed to be in the underground. There's no way out. You're just gonna be there, no matter what. But people love you because you stayed that way, because you stuck to your guns and never stopped playing what you play, you know?
formed Comets in 1999. Ben Flashman and I formed the group in Santa Cruz, California. You know, he and I were into this like anthemic rock music, you know, grand funk and some punk rock stuff in this. It's just kind of old favorites and stuff like that. And we were just sort of beginning to kind of get into, you know, further out stuff like, um, you know, free jazz, really start to delve into the meat of Coltrane and Abu Dhabi and the free jazz stuff. Oh, so it's not, it's not just a, the synth that makes horn sounds. No, it's for your synth. It's an effect. It's, it's effects for horn. Sick. Yeah. So yeah. you can put the bassoon effect on your... Yeah. I mean, flute. Or whatever. Yeah. You so could the, do full on Marconi scores with this thing, just with one sack. You know, our original mission was to try to put those two different things that usually don't go together, together. We're definitely trying to do something more than just ape the psychedelic sound or whatever. We're you know, trying to do something more than just be trippy or stoned or, you know, these kinds of things. Um, are we a psychedelic man? Yeah. Back in the Caius days, the term stoner rock didn't exist. It was usually filed under metal, which was kind of offensive to us at the time. To be honest with you, I've just never really been concerned about or personally use classifications like that. If people ask me what kind of band uh, Ghost Tank was, I was just like, it's like a heavy rock band, you know? Couldn't call it grunge and they couldn't call it metal couldn't call it punk, so they had to come up with some kind of name for it. And, I mean, to me, it's just regular hard rock. Well, Stone Rock is a drag as a label for people that don't get stoned, because it kind of is a ticket for them to dismiss the, the music. Nowadays, when you stay Stone Rock, you know exactly what that means. You know, it's like fuzzed out guitars, like huge riffs. It's like melodic to a certain extent, most of it. Um, but in a rock and roll way that sort of echoes the, the classic rock. I've always said stoner rock is just grunge, and really both of them are just 70s heavy rock continued. We're Monster Magnet, Free Man 2, Caius, and you know, we're doing something in like 93, 94. Thing. It was like coming out of grunge, 
you know, it was darker, more heavy psychedelic, weird shit in it, you know, how Spine of God. But by the time they caught on, you know, bands were changing, like Nebula was changing, Queens of the Stone Age were changing, and they're still trying to call it Stone Rock. There's the whole like sort of musician magazine aspect to a lot of that stuff of like what's the equipment you're using and how's it being recorded and um, you know we're not going to go digital and we're going to have like these warm sounding amplifiers and use tubes and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't really connected to the desert scene as the desert scene was happening. We did get connected to it after Man's Ruin because we were all on the same record label together. You know I think it's probably fair to say that you know Man's Ruin Records really is responsible for introducing people to a lot of this music. I happened to cover all of those bands for the first issue because um, I was doing it uh, sort of like a coverage on, um, on Man's Ruin, that genre of music that you know was described as stoner rock, which is kind of an unfortunate uh, moniker that it got. After that, there is just this huge influx of bands you know, sort of copying that sound. I don't really know where the term came from. I'll be honest, I haven't researched uh, researched it, but um, I, I assume it's, uh, I'm guessing it's just music that's just kind of uh, kind of jammy and, and uh, I hate to use it organic, but I will, organic. Um, I don't know, what is stoner rock? You tell me. <laughs> Fats and Jetson came out of a, a, a rock and roll club me and Larry opened as a result of, of uh, getting tired of getting busted doing generator parties and, and knowing that we could do it ourselves. August of 1994. We were all major Black Flag fans, and you know, Black Flag was a real inspiration to all of us. And we figured, hey, let's, you know, sort of throw ourselves at the bottom of the bill, you know, when Greg Ginn plays in town. And we did, and we played, and that was our first show. And Greg, uh, Greg, I guess, really liked what we were doing, and you know, offered to put a record out for us on SS Key. Blues music, for me, the rawness and the, the honesty of it is, um, to me, similar to, to the, the beautiful things about, that I enjoy of, of punk rock. It's not unusual for for me to to you know within the same song to want to experience Howlin' Wolf, Black Flag, Link Ray, and Devo. Very primitive. You know, we put our records and we play, and you know, it's, and in that sense, it's it's really pure. You know, it's like we do we do it on our own terms, and it's not about like you know surviving. It's about you know, quality of life.
remember um, the scene in San Francisco in the 90s being, um, well, a sleep, neurosis, Grotus, the Melvins. There was a lot of, uh, like, crusty stuff coming up, like, well, neurosis was the biggest thing around here then, neurosis and the Melvins, like, that was the center of everything. And I started jamming with this band in high school, which is actually Alan Chris, who are in the home right now. Uh, they had this band as best as death. They really wanted to be in a band. Probably a reaction from misery in life, you know? I don't know, there was a friendship and, you know, sleep in large part, it, it was a, a three really good friends and music came out of that. And me and Al were just sitting around on LSD or doing bong hits or something and Al came up with sleep. And I was like, wow, that's a great name or whatever. It was more than just going to see a show. It was like an experience that would, you know, nail you from the center of you. Yeah, it was massive. Was, I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. You know, it's like red, green, blue, sleep. They had put out two records, Volume 1, Holy Mountain. Um, and then they got signed to a major label, London Records. And uh, I don't really know that London Records knew what they were going to get because Sleep was sort of planning their, uh, for lack of a better term, their masterpiece. It was one 52-minute song. Jerusalem, I guess it was originally called Dope Smoker, um, but the lyrics sort of incorporated this sort of like bong-huffing caravan through the Holy Land. This was like five years that the song developed. They had the whole thing written and it got tied up with like record label wranglings. Basically they were sitting on this thing, it was ready to go and it was like dying on the vine, pretty much, you know? It's like they wanted to get it out there and they couldn't, and I think they had to wait like a year before they could even record it. Uh, for a, at least like a two year period, they refused to play that song live <laughs> because they were so convicted about not hearing, not, people not hearing it yet. We tried to stop the song and it just felt all awkward, like it was supposed to have kept going and it, it, was, it was just, us finding how do we set this thing to back to the ground? How does it land? Sometimes the riff is just so fucking good that you just want to hear it over and over and over again. Sometimes for 52 minutes, you know? As far as I know, London knew the whole time about, about their plans for this song. We started fucking with um, like just kind of this weird, these weird like kind of almost Indian music scales. A lot of the intent was conveying that hypnosis that the band would actually go into while playing it. We let the drummer on that song like carry that song. You know what I mean? Oh, that whole song is based off drums and timing and hitting in the right spot. There are a lot of myths, uh, legends, we could say, surrounding the making of Jerusalem. <laughs> Some of it might not be mythology. The main one, I guess, is, um, is that they blew the advance on weed. Well, the weed part's totally true. <laughs> we blew a lot of money on weed and time and just <laughs> the delivering the master in a skull bong. Well, no, <laughs> it'd be a good idea. I wish we would have thought of it. We were going for a... Definitely the heaviest thing ever recorded. There was no, uh, no expense spared as far as overdoing things like, oh, you want to put another guitar track? Let's do that, you know? Let's do two more. We spent like $75,000 on amps, on custom-made amps and guitars and all sorts of stuff. song is a journey. I mean, not just sonically, but if you follow the lyrics, it's, it's a caravan. It's a caravan. They're, they're delivering weed. It's like, dude, you use Lungsman and Hashishian in the same line. How do you do it? We turned that into the label, and they heard it, and they were like, man, it's too heavy. There's nothing we can do with this. It's too this. It's too that. Um, and somebody at the label, I don't know who, 
uh, got it in their mind that if they had somebody remix it, it would be that much different. <laughs> Dude, you guys signed a band that, with a 60-minute song. Like, what were you expecting? Like, radio, you know? The record got shelved. It came out like three years after it was recorded, which ended up being about two and a half years after Sleep broke up. And, you know, in those years, it sort of got, became, because of the, in part because it really was this fantastic record, and, but in part because of the mystique surrounding it, it became regarded as this sort of classic record. A classic lost record, really. Sometimes shortly after uh, the remix was done, uh, they decided not to be a band anymore. And that was in, uh, I think, 97. Around two, 2000 and 2001, 2002, uh, Matt's manager, uh, Matt Pike from High on Fire, who was also in sleep, Matt, his manager, Todd, asked me if I wanted to do the real version of that album, which was Dope Smoker, which is the full on, you know, uh, unedited, unmixed, you know, un unmixed by Sardi, who they brought in there to clean it up and obviously they weren't even happy with that. They asked me if I wanted to put it out and I said, absolutely. I liked the D Dope Smoker version because it was a little longer and it was the mix that we did with Billy. You know, it wasn't, no one else came in from the record company and chopped it all up. I think the three of us have made peace with the song that we know to exist inside versus what's out there and what people think the song really is. And I think that's been the way that all three of us have continued and put that to rest. You know, it's that sort of like that, that lifelong battle between like art and what record companies perceive as product. Are you guys estranged for a while after sleep? Yeah, here and there, here and there. All of us were. Yeah, there's a lot of pain and didn't know quite what to say to each other. And uh, there was still love and there was, there was love and hate and confusion and we just had to sort it out for a while. I didn't talk to Chris for a number of years after the whole uh, dope smoker thing. But, uh, and then Al, uh, it was a very sad thing, actually. Al stopped playing music altogether uh, for five years. Um, I won't say altogether, but he wasn't very public about like seeing anybody or you know being in a band or anything like that. I think sleep was was almost the the quintessential of this of this sort of. Um, this revival that started happening in the early 90s of what became called stoner rock or doom or whatever. You know, I mean, they kind of picked up what St. Vitus was doing and the Melvins and Black Sabbath, of course. But I think they kind of nailed it. I mean, it could almost be said that they got it and made a couple of the, the greatest of the albums that, that needed to be made in that genre. Determined from the f first jam that we had um, as own that there wasn't any other element necessary to what we were going for. Didn't need to go into traditional, you know, structures and get a guitar for the sake of fitting into some preordained sound. It comes in moments where uh, I'm stopped and I have to jot down the emotional feeling into words that serve not only symbolic purposes, but on a very practical level, rhythmic purposes. They're certainly not assembled with a, a view of grammatical soundness. Sometimes people say, 
don't you know any other riff? And they will pay attention closely because they're they're all very the repetition that we do also there were things in even on some of the earliest albums that we listened to and grew up appreciating we would hear segments in these songs and would say to ourselves god why doesn't that repeat some more i wish that would go on for 14 15 minutes it should Drugs can really make you write a song or do anything. If anything, they make you not. It's not until you like kind of get solid and yeah, come and down somewhat. Yeah. To get anything done. We does it, something to do with listening. It definitely, yeah. Not playing, it but helps. listening. Yeah. Just what it w works for me is uh, using it just as a verifying tool. It, sort of it, in a musical sense, dilates parts of your mind. Plants are alive and I've, I feel like I've been communicated with, you know, like through these things. I mean, if there's a way to communicate between species, then that's probably it. By altering your perception, you can see things slightly different, you know, and it's good in a way, but it's not necessary or it's not in the end, I think, what it's about. You know, it's a essential part of what we do. This isn't actually going to be on film. <laughs> it. it may be about the journey, the quintessential journey, you know, or the, the idea of traveling into different realms, but that doesn't, that may include drug taking, but it's not limited to drug taking. People like H.P. Lovecraft, uh, Lord Dunsany, Clark Ashton Smith, all these writers from the 30s and turn of the century that were uh, really into imagination, almost for imagination's sake. Especially as times get heavier or more politically dire, you, you typically see more fantasy. You see more um, artists like reveling in, in idealism or in, in their own personal fantasies. It takes motivation and dedication to write songs and get into a recording studio and dedicate your life to making music with a band. And I don't think the average stoner really gets that far into it. grew up outside of the city, or Steve and I grew up in uh, Virginia for him and Maryland for me. But uh, just that time when you realize how much music comes from D.C. and was coming out of D.C., you know, with the whole punk scene and Fugazi and that 
the whole Discord world of music that was going on all through the 80s. We were in those kind of bands for a while, and you know, we just felt the need to go back to what originally got us so excited about music in junior high, you know, bands like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, bands that, you know, really laid back and had a whole mood and a vibe that couldn't really carry the listener away. We're here uh, mixing uh, and actually recording, we did some tracking here too, our fifth record um, at Sunset Sound, a uh, legendary studio on Sunset Strip in Hollywood. There's a lot of talk about bands that are kind of like uh, doing a lot of like classic rock sort of stuff at this point, and we kind of wanted to just kind of go back to the very basics where a lot of that stuff was done. All our records in the past have been heavily overdubbed with a lot of different atmosphere and effects, and, and now we're kind of trying to capture more of the performance. Just like uh, spontaneous and more raw. Like a lot of the music I write is thinking about images, like forest, ocean, stars, walking. Heavy weather or, you know, big massive trees or cliffs or, um, you know, it's definitely an earthy kind of relation. Trees are so beautiful that make you feel happy and uh, they're, they seem so ancient and old and have such a giant story to tell. Yeah, I mean, there definitely is an element in our music involving nature and spirituality, I guess, and those are like the two heaviest things there are. My mother was into like illustrating stuff from nature, and, like she, she would draw mushrooms and plants and flowers, and so that was sort of um, surrounded me when I was a kid, and um, you know, I find that stuff really inspirational. Sound and sight are very similar and always have a relationship to, to each other, to me. Whether it's watching a musician play or 
um, listening to an album and looking at the artwork. Homemade posters are coming yeah. back into style. I think it's a rejection of corporate art, you know, the corporate masterminding of the look of the band. I actually sit down with it on headphones and really concentrate on it and, and give it a real, a real run through where I, I hear it and close my eyes or concentrate on see see what happens, you know, if anything comes to me. I mean, I didn't really like any music graphics back in the 90s. I really was, was not into that, you know, vampire girls and sort of characters with big heads. And, yeah, I mean, I guess like that whole Kozic and Coop style. I do a lot of horizon and sky things because to me that really represents this, this wideness, this infinite range of uh, possibilities. And where the sky meets the ocean, I always saw that as being kind of like this almost portal or gateway into something else. You know, thinking about like, what makes psychedelic music, you know, like the comparing it to art, I think it's like anything that's super, really far out and creative. Some of the record covers, I really kind of got into it and in trying to make that like multi-level creation. Penso che la psichedelia di Malleus stia nel suo disegnare e interpretare la donna. Dioni, non c'è la donna materna, la donna buona, forse la donna più, più cattiva. Il stesso di, di immaginare qualcosa è un'esplorazione mentale. I was really into hypnosis still am this design team from uh from england did a lot of stuff like uh dark side of the moon and led zeppelin covers and a lot of other really significant and recognizable things and uh roger dean of course an image itself you know speaks for itself but then i really really like letters and i really like the aesthetic of a word that's this is some stuff i've been doing lately just these couple things here, just like in the past couple weeks even. That was this year's calendar, and that's the next residual echoes cover. Because I was doing very abstract kind of work that was very detailed. And I think it sort of it was a new form of psychedelia, which wasn't the flower power type, but more a very harsh, um, sort of almost apocalyptic version of psychedelia. I think um, the, the word psychedelic is very interesting and I actually think that the stuff I do is always psychedelic in the sense that it's striving to have the sort of visionary aspect to it. Um, stylistically it doesn't have, it has more in common with technical drawing or architectural drawing. Something has a really big, big sound to me. It sort of looks to me like this vastness, this open space, clouds and, and, and um, scapes. And uh, when it's the kind of slow, heavy thing, that's sort of what I envision. Um, some of the stuff I get from um, the faster stuff, like High on Fire, it's warlike imagery that gets the blood moving. Album, the Art of Self Defense. It has more of a sleep vibe to it, but I was changing my style up. But I've been so used to playing with sleep, I have this new rhythm section that's a little bit faster mid tempo. But it, if I look back now, it's kind of slow, and it's kind of because we were evolving and finding our new selves. You know, I was finding myself guitar playing, and I just started singing. So that was all new to me. So you can hear the influence of sleep 
had on me coming out of that band, at least on my point. We started wanting to do some faster, kind of thrashier, heavier power house riffs, you know. It's like metal, but not like a typical metal band. Maybe I'm pissed off about something. Maybe I'm, you know, upset or sad or someone fucked me over. I'll put that down on the paper, but I'll put it in a way I'll, I'll use imagery from something I've read or something that, you know, I was interested in to convey how I feel, even though it's a complete mask. If you can transfer your feelings into a piece of music, and, and how you feel, whether it be anger, whether it be love, sadness, anything. That's what makes a great artist a great musician. A lot of the records that, you know, we look back on from the 70s that are very sort of collectible, weird, obscure, you know, Groundhog's records, Sir Lord Baltimore, uh, May Blitz, um, <coughs> Budgie Hawkwind, they were all on major labels at the time. None of them would be on major labels now. They would all be on indie labels. And I attribute that to the, um, I think it's consolidation and, and shrinkage of the record industry. Screw the record companies, you know. They've just done such a shit job for the last 25 years, you know, that they don't deserve anything. I've always been attracted to the darker side of sounds and art, which usually leads to the art being and the music being underground and independent. People in my early youth had always told me, um, especially my parents had always told me, oh, you gotta play what the people wanna hear. You gotta play what the people wanna hear or else, you know, you're never gonna make any money. And, you know, my, I was just like, oh, you know, I don't care if I make any money. Because I, I knew from the very beginning that, that my music was a very special gift, but it was also this was a very special art. I mean, we're doing things that are appalling and contrary to the mainstream. So, so be it. This is, you know, this is what we're doing, and we're, and, and, and we're going to keep doing it, and we don't care if it's going to, um, if it's going to, and make us rich and famous. We're not looking for that. At the same time, yeah, you know, I'm starting to get older. And I'm looking at, man, I wish I did have a house. I wish I could take care of and marry some girl. Or, you know, you think about that when you get older. You know, there's a lot more um, careerism that goes on because of the inflation and expense in having a secure lifestyle. Like money and like recording, having 
comfortable recording space and tour support, uh, I'm not against that. <laughs> the bands are probably better off not being on a major label, to tell you the truth, so I wouldn't piss and moan too much about it. You'll get a nice advance, you might be able to buy yourself a house, but then after that, I mean, that's if you're lucky. Our friend Brant once called us insane hobbyists, in that, you know, we don't actively try to go out and tour, we're not actively trying to make a career out of this. Mario's parents and my parents have been in the restaurant business longer than we've been alive. We all moved up here trying to figure out what we're going to do and um, eventually uh, end up with a job, hopefully, in the restaurant and um, still being able to make music. I mean, I'm not planning on stopping playing music just because I'm not making any money at it. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, I have to supplement my income, like, every few years pretty aggressively. Um, I think I'm going to be selling a lot of stuff, so. Outside the band, um, I have a full-time job as a post-production producer in the film and video business. They're just good old day jobs that we have. Um, you know, for instance, I work at a flower place, you know, delivering flowers and helping set up at a wedding or whatever, driving a white van around town, you know. We're starting to do pretty well on tour. You know, you can make some decent money, especially in towns out west in the big cities. But I personally still walk dogs. And, uh, I know Steve does artwork on the side to support himself. You know, so I wouldn't say it's quite there yet. You know, or at least sustainable it doesn't let us live the sort of life we want, you know, which is a roof over our head, food to eat. You painted that? Oh my goodness, look at this. We work it out uh, with, with my wife. We work it out. We, uh, it made more sense for me to take care of the kids. So we decided that that's what we do, that I would effectively become stay-at-home dad. This is going to be the next generation. You know, this is going to be the next generation. This, 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 this is basically actually more Instead of it being me being afraid of, oh my God, you know, there's going to be a nuclear war and we're going to lose them, it's more like these are going to be the people that are going to lead us out of it. We're able to just make music. Yeah. We're pretty broke. <laughs> yeah. Destitute. But happy. But yeah. We do uh, an odd job if we have to, if we don't tour too much, but we've actually been pretty good at touring. Just yeah, there's not music. many jobs that you could find anyway that would let you work yeah. for like a week, Nobody's you know, gonna 10 hire days, us. and then let you disappear <laughs> for a month, you know? Nobody's going to hire me. <laughs> Do you ever hear that Bill Hicks joke where we just talk about that stoner joke that Bill Hicks did about sure I could sure I could wake up at dawn, get in traffic, go to a job that I hate that doesn't satisfy me creatively? Sure, I could do that. And he's like, or <laughs> get up at noon and learn how to play the sitar. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> we kinda have a combination. <laughs> he's like, downing, downing. Well, usually I get construction jobs, but my knee, I hyperextended my knee. So I had to go out, I'm, um, hopefully I'm, I'm prep cooking and uh, trying to help this, uh, this bistro. And both Bob and I are both, ha we don't work together, but we're both house painters and probably have been since, I, I've been since I was maybe 20. The fact that I'm doing what I'm doing, it's like it almost kind of like, overshadows any sort of like, well, I'm broke this month, or, you know, it's like, I just, just kind of keep on going. <laughs> yeah. We're kind of in this back alley, which is cool, because we're kind of this underground record store. You know, we don't pay attention to street dates on record releases of any of like, you know, the new White Stripes or anything. I mean, we'll get in if we want to, you know, and it's like, we just kind of do it totally on our own terms. Money's paper. I wipe my ass with paper. You know, it's it's not it's not that essential for my soul. You know, can't take it with you if I died tomorrow. Big deal. I have a lot of money that I didn't spend.
while doing Goat Snake, um, I reconnected with Steve O'Malley. He moved to Los Angeles, and so we basically came up with the, the concept of, uh, of Sun. Two dudes getting drunk and stoned and playing with as many amps as we possibly can and basically just playing Melvin's and Earth riffs, <laughs> trying to play them slower than those bands played them. Working with drone sounds in a musical context, I think historically has always been to sort of be able to meditate or transcend some sort of just waking phase. I'm not like technically very good. I can't do a solo. I can't solo very well. I can't solo at all. <laughs> uh, and uh, but I really like to manipulate and work with 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 tone and 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 low tones and subtones. I think it's um, actually working with some of the elements that are much older about music in general, which I think metal music also has, you know, as a folk music, it has, you know, things that probably were very similar in, you know, war music or tribalism or sort of this like amplifying energy state music. Underground isn't underground anymore. Underground is, to me, like the new uh, above ground, so to speak. Like a, it's just a lot of little labels that have sort of come together as a community, and uh, you know, people now know how to access them and get the, the stuff that's on the labels a lot more than they used to be able to. They're more sophisticated. They're smarter. They want, you know, they they want something different, and like major labels aren't giving it to them. You know, indies are. There's so many outlets. I mean, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a weird trade-off because I mean, on one hand, the labels are pretty much vanishing. You don't have major labels signing bands. You pretty much uh, a lot of times have to just release it on your own. But on the other hand, you can release it on your own, and you can keep all the money from it and not have it go to a record label and whatever. You record your own album at home, sell it on the internet, sell it at the concerts. They're like kids in a candy store, they can kind of do whatever they want, you know, and, and it's great. I, th I, I think that the fact that they're independent allows them to do that. I think the best thing that's going on now is that people are starting to 
look for new influences and incorporate other stuff and um, as music gets more and more accessible, old music gets more accessible, people are finding new things to be inspired by. There's a lot of word of mouth, you know what I mean? And I think the internet is just to connect a, a, a you know, word of mouth, you know, time, you know, square, cube or whatever. You get to a certain city in Germany or somewhere and people know who you are, you're like, fuck, how do they know? They're a fucking computer. <laughs> There's this scene, or whatever it is, there's just these people are hungry for decent music. Because the radio and commercial music is just, you know, it's a, a night, it's a nightmare. The charts are dominated by, you know, urban music, hip hop, country, pop music, divas. There's always going to be an audience for the heavy rock, but you don't see it at the top of the charts. And that's fine. That's just the way it's going to be, I guess, for this kind of music. It is very underground and. That's, I guess, what's kind of cool about it, you know, we have, although some people that might want to make it big might not think it's cool, but I do. I don't really have any desire to, to be doing anything more. You have to do it. There's no choice. Whether people hate it or people love it, it doesn't make a difference. You're doing it because you have to, because it makes sense of your reality, it makes sense of your day-to-day -day life, it makes sense of the world around you. I mean, I know what we do is definitely out of, uh, what? appeals to the masses these days, I guess. But uh, I don't think it's from anything of not wanting to appeal to the masses. You know, I think it's just, uh, hopefully, you know, the ultimate goal would be to bring the masses along into uh, something that, you know, does take a lot more imagination, is focused on something with a little bit more depth. Every period has its visionaries, and I think that some of the bands that we're talking about have that sense of wanting to be outside. You know, if you guys got very successful in a short period of time, and you were playing arenas and stuff, would you, would you be into that kind of lifestyle, you think? Well, sure I would, but it hasn't happened yet, and um, I don't think it's gonna. <laughs> Which it doesn't, that's not a, I'm not thrown in a towel or something like that. I'm a, I, I like to think that I keep myself a little ahead of the game just musically by sticking to my guns, you know, and, and doing what I enjoy, and doing it masterfully and with, you know, with no shame, no regrets about, like, what I do. Slumber kill by rain.